Well, welcome back to Opening Statements. This morning, we're shining our spotlight on the 1995 conviction of former police officer Michael Chappell. So he's behind bars for killing 53-year-old Emma Jean Thompson. And prosecutors allege that Chappell met with her to discuss some stolen money from her home and to possibly even steal from her. But Chappell has always maintained his innocence. And he spoke with me and told me his side of the story. So first question, just how are you? As good as it can be expected after uh, 30 years and seven months. So why did you meet with Emma Jean Thompson in the first place? All right, let me, let me tell you how it came to be. On April 3rd, 1993, I get a call to go to her, uh, her trailer. Her and her son, her 20-something-year-old son there, 22, I think, Michael Thompson. She starts telling me that her money is gone. At the time that Emma Jean Thompson was killed, you were running, you said it was kind of a low-level drug investigation where you had many different informants, you had people on tape, and you said there might have been fears of where it would lead. Was it leading toward people with badges? It was. So who do you think killed Emma Jean Thompson? <laughs> and you're not going like you're not going like my answer. I can just tell you who didn't do it. And ironically, it's the two lying cops and the firemen and myself. Because that's the only person I can account for during the state's window. Did you kill Emma Jean Thompson? No, I, no, I did not. No, I did not kill Emma Jean Thompson. So you said that there were three police officers, around six or seven firefighters that were there that night at the fire station when you were. Didn't they vouch for you? The firemen, the firemen then and today still say the same thing, that uh, I was with them. Reddy was there and Sergeant Stone was there. And they never changed their story. It's only... Uh, the question is, is the police that changed them, two, the two officers that changed their story. Why do you think that is? Well, one of them, Reddy, uh, I can't even imagine why he would just deny, keep denying that it never happened with so many people naming him by name and physical description. And then Sergeant Stone, I believe he was compromised. They got to him to change his story. And who's I they? Believe, uh, who's they, Michael? Uh, the, the, our superiors uh, and uh, the XDA. All right, that was just a little bit of my interview with Michael Chappell. I want to bring in my guest now in the studio with me, investigative true crime podcaster. He's the host of the podcast, In the Land of Lies. It is all about this case. Sean Kipe is with us. And joining us remotely, we have Michael Chappell's attorney, Billy Rennie, joining us remotely. Uh, Billy, good morning to you. Uh, Sean, welcome back. Uh, you talked to us before on the show, and we really weren't even able to scratch the surface because uh, the information that you're working with and uh, Henry Ball, who's been the, the private investigator on this case, who just sent me this book. It just arrived. I got it in my office yesterday, so have not read it yet. Um, he's saying that the information you're going through is voluminous. Uh, so since we last talked, Sean, let's start with... What updates have you learned about? Uh, on the phone with Michael uh, that day, you know, was Henry, and, and they said this is, there's going to be a lot more coming out. There's going to be more. We're learning a lot more. It's going to change the game. It's going to turn this case upside down. What, if anything, can you share with us this morning? That's probably more something that uh, Mr. Rennie um, would, would share. You know, I, I certainly don't want to speak out of turn because of how important this Upcom uh, upcoming hearing is for Mike, but you know there were seven sealed boxes of evidence, and they were sealed for 30 years. You know, uh, which is very odd, first of all, for a case that was closed, and and so, you know, the first thing we wondered was why why is that mm -hmm. information and what is in there that's so important? It has to be sealed for 30 years. So those have been opened um, on order of the judge. And you know, there, there certainly are things, and I don't know what I can and can't say as far as what we found in those boxes, but uh, I think it will show uh, certainly that 
Mike was really onto something um, in his investigation of, of other officers at GCPD. So this low-level drug investigation that was leading to, essentially what he told me in the conversation was that he was talking to informants on the street who were saying that there were police who were dirty, who were providing protection for the dope dealers, and they get a payoff, and so they get some of the money that's uh, obtained through the drug sales, and, and they allow the dealing to continue on the streets, and then everybody's happy. You got your dealers happy, you got your cops who are getting their palms greased happy. That's essentially the story. I'm paraphrasing here for the sake of time, but that's what he told me. Do I have it right, Sean? Yeah, yeah, it's like watching Heat. You know, mm -hmm. with Al Pacino, yeah. I mean, it's, you, Great you don't you don't believe that these things actually happen mm -hmm. in the real world. You don't want to believe these things, but right. they do, and time and time again, and certainly in this case is no exception. I mean, we have evidence, and I think at this point we've proven, mm -hmm. you know, unequivocally that this this stuff was going on. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, no, you know, and um, look. You can be supportive of police in general. I certainly am. I say it all the time on this show. Um, but, you know, just like in any uh, profession, there aren't always great cops. And, you know, and he says he was on to some dirty business, and that's why he was made a martyr, so to speak. He was the one that he says the investigation was flipped onto him. Um, Billy Rennie, uh, tell us, what can you tell us? What can you share? You know, Sean seemed to think he doesn't want to step on your toes here if you want to release some new information. What can you tell us this morning um, in terms of the new developments, please? Hey, um, good morning, and thank you for having me on. Um, I am uh, surprised by a lot of the materials that we have found. Um, Sean is right, there were seven sealed boxes. Five of those boxes were um, just the state's evidence that were sealed to preserve that information should the case eventually move on to an appeal or post-conviction relief. Um, the other two boxes, though, were um, filled with three things. Essentially, uh, the Northside Precinct investigation, the precinct that Mike was working for at the time of his arrest, uh, they conducted an internal investigation into um, some of the ongoings of, of uh, the Northside Precinct, kind of very similar to what Mike himself was doing prior to his arrest. Um, of course, Mike was also uh, one of the subjects that they were investigating during that Northside Precinct investigation. The other two uh, topics of, of um, information that were sealed were uh, the investigation into the murder, uh, I'm sorry, into the suicide of J.P. Morgan and um, some of the Ill illegal conduct surrounding J.P. Morgan's suicide on behalf of an officer named Bodie Hurst, who essentially was accused of going into J.P. Morgan's uh, uh, computer room and deleting computer information. Uh, they were missing disks. Um, we, we believe that had that information been accessible by police, um, that they would have been able to themselves verify that J.P. Morgan was uh, involved in these illicit activities. And even more than that, that he was, um, you know, potentially uh, left a suicide note that, that maybe would have left a paper trail all the way back to Emma Jean Thompson. Mm. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll never know those things, but that officer was actually charged with um, compromising the investigation into J.P. Morgan's suicide. Um, and we do know, based on that officer, Bodie Hurst's comments to other officers, that, were, that there were some very strange things on J.P. Morgan's computer, including um, essentially dirt that he, was, that he was collecting on certain members of the Gwinnett County government at the time, and also on members of the same law enforcement unit that J.P. Morgan himself worked for. Hmm. When I talked to Michael Chapel, he seemed to indicate that he believes J.P. Morgan may have been responsible. Do you believe the same? Absolutely, and, and that's what we're endeavoring to, to show the habeas court. Um, we have a witness that can place J.P. Morgan um, with Emma Jean Thompson prior to her, her death, uh, that um, that witness followed J.P. Morgan to the Gwynco muffler shop where Emma Jean Thompson's body was eventually found, and um, he uh, was able to conceal himself such that he was uh, not seen, um, and and he actually watches J.P. Morgan and another officer forcibly remove uh, Emma Jean Thompson from the vehicle they took to Gwinko Muffler Shop, 
he hears a, a bang and, and a muscle, uh, um, uh, gun flash and Emma Jean Thompson falls to the ground. So um, a very different set of circumstances than what the jury was told about in 1995 when Mike's case went to trial. Mm. Um, and, you know, certainly if, if that story is believed by the habeas court, then of course there's, there's no question about whether or not Mike is going to be exonerated. So our mission is to try to build up the credibility of, of essentially that witness and the narrative that he has to tell us um, and the judge has to weigh the credibility of that against the evidence that came out of Mike's trial. And when's this hearing supposed to happen, Billy? So the court um, kindly gave us time to ask Gwinnett County to unseal the sealed boxes. Um, and um, Gwinnett County uh, Court agreed to do that. So we have made our way through the five to 6,000 pages worth of documents that were sealed in those two um, boxes. And um, we are we are currently working with some forensics experts who we hope will um, you know lend some credibility to our, our narrative. Uh, we a after we get that work done, um, we're hoping to get on the calendar as quickly as possible. Okay, so no uh, hopefully date. in February, March, but no date okay. yet. Okay. Okay. Please keep us posted on that, um, Sean. I, I want to give you the last word here um, because. Uh, you're truly independent here as somebody, you know, who does investigative work uh, in the true crime community. You know, you don't have a, a horse in the race, so to speak, but you believe in Michael Chappell's innocence. Why? It's, you know, <laughs> because of the evidence. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't, I wasn't someone who knew Mike Chappell. I wasn't family friends with him, you know, um, and, and said, you know, I'm going to go out and prove this guy's innocence. It's not what happened. You know, this case was brought to me. I read the evidence myself. I looked, I spoke to people who were there, who saw Mike. Mm -hmm. And, y you know, you, you, you learn all this information and, and you have no choice but to go, he didn't and he couldn't have committed this crime if he wanted to. Mm. In the Land of Lies is Sean's podcast. Uh, check it out. There's so much more. And you continue to add episodes after, you know, episodes. It's not done yet. It's a continuation uh, that's going to be going on. We'll go until this is done. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, we'd love to have you both back because, uh, again, it's really tough to get into all of this, the details, the names. We're doing our best to unpack it uh, slowly but surely. Uh, but uh, thank you both kindly. Uh, Billy Rennie, thank you so much. Uh, Sean Kipe, thank you so much. Great to see you thank again. You.